My mission today, which I've chosen to accept, is to try and switch focus on studies of archaeology of ritual a bit. Uh, from the ideographic, i.e. I understandings of symbolism of particular examples, so when you look at a particular society, you look at their rituals, you try and work out what all of that means. I'm trying to say that there's a thing called ritual. It doesn't really matter what society or group it's in. There's a thing called ritual action, which is defined by certain ways of specializing action, which I think we can study. And that's why I call it a nomothetical approach as opposed to an ideographic approach. Uh, this is the... Um, this is the theoretical archaeology group, isn't it? So I can start <laughs> tossing words like that around. All right? So these are the things I'm going to talk about. First of all, I want to just uh, point people out in case they haven't seen it yet. An article I think is really important by Svensson, uh, which puts the emphasis on ritual action as opposed to particular symbols that we might come, we might be looking for as a result of finding ritual in the archaeological record. Ritual action. We'll have a look at that first. Then I want to look at the um, the nomothetical approach to specialised human actions. Not this is the thing I'm saying. Not an ideographic approach to ideas about symbolism and meaning in specific cultures. I want to look about at the nomothetical approach about what makes human beings what their ritualised actions actually are. What makes an action ritualised? Yes not the symbolism that might flow in and out of it polysemically or whatever. So we'll look at that. Uh, briefly have a think about an interesting uh, equation, which is about the rich, about ritual being on a continuum with culture. There, yeah, that's a bit big, isn't it? I'll just throw that in as well. Um, and then have a look at expanding uh, an analytical framework that I've been using anyway to study funerary ritual. I think that if we take it out of even just the funerary sphere, I think we can start applying these sorts of um, indexes, if you like, to all rituals as how ritualized actions come about. So an expanded analytical framework. Um, proposed the development of the pro uh, funerary process approach to encompass all installation rituals. And that last one there, how rituals, oh no, and consider that then in terms of a Neolithic site. So we look at the sort of framework I use for uh, looking at funerary rituals, look at the different types of rituals that we're getting on a Neolithic site. And finally, think about how rituals change, which is Another thing that um, I think the idea that ritual is some sort of a fixed thing in definition still has too much, is still too pervasive. Actually, rituals allow for the thing we call improvisation. Okay, and that's actually one of the most interesting things about ritual, as far as I'm concerned. So, the Edward Swenson or Swenson uh, article, there it is, it's just a big reference on the screen for you. Take a photo of it read it. I think it's worth reading. 2015. Okay. And my point, overall overriding point, is that he's saying about the archaeology of ritual per se, not the archaeology of ritual in the particular groups of people that he studies, but what makes ritual action uh, something we can define as being different or specialised from normal actions. And that's not to say that there's ritual over here and normal behaviour over here. There's a continuum. Okay? So this is, gets rid of the ideas of um, there being a separate thing called ritual. So there's his abstract. I'm going to highlight my particular bits I want to talk about. So he's talking about material framing, bundling, structured depositions. We'll have all talked about, I'm sure. Many of us will have done if, we're into, if we've encountered this in the archaeological record. He writes about ritual in its own right, the ritual experience as a distinctive material process. Amplified materialization of the ritual process, often entailing the performative bundling of disparate material items in archaeological deposits, like witch bottles. That's bundling. Okay? And this, is, this is one of the things that we recognize ritual in the archaeological record because of bundling. We find that things have been put together 
and deliberately installed in some way. A, a burial is, a, is, a, is an easy one to see that that involves some sort of ritual bundling. There are other types of bundles that we find in the archaeological record. So, was just, so is everyone happy so far? Some frowns around the room? Everyone okay? Yeah? <coughs> right, good. Thank you for bearing with me. So um, there's a little uh, diagram that could have an arrow at both ends. So specialization of culture brings about is this ritualization. And Victor Turner described rich, uh, ritual as culture in the subjunctive mood. And I just want to, because I think that's really excellent for one thing, I just wanted to say that. Um, but for the other, from another point of view, I wanted to point out that at the same time, is culture, um, uh, is culture ritual in the indicative mood? Just throw that one out there. So in as much as ritual overemphasizes actions and objects, yeah, it places emphasis, it frames them by specializing them, by repeating them by repeating them, by repeating them, by repeating them, by repeating them. For example, that's, a, that's not a normal way of speaking, is it? Right? So you, you, you emphasize it by things like repetition. So as much as ritual does that, is it also coming back the other way to the way we dress, how we get into our, our particular body art, all the rest of it, those things that we just see around us and interact with on a daily basis? Is it a continuum? So that was my second thing. And I've said NB, that's a little note in the margin. This avoids the dualism of ritual and non-ritual, which I think we have moved beyond now, haven't we? We see that, that looking for just ritual things in the archeological record is, is, is the wrong premise to start from, yes? Ritual is part of the habitus, the, the uh, the normal activities of ancient and other societies and cultures. So I've just said ritual just takes it further so that um, specialising becomes paramount. That's, what I, that's why I repeated that sentence over and over again a minute ago. Now, I'm not saying that ideographicists shouldn't exist. I'm more than happy for those they want to study a particular culture, uh, its synchronic polysemy in its, of its ritual, its diachronic liminality of its ritual. Yes, so moving synchronic, synchronic polysemy, all these things are happening, all these meanings here are happening at the same time. Yes, all kinds of score. But through time, diachronic liminality. <coughs> all of those things are, are going to be part of the symbolism are going to engage in the symbolism, albeit in a liminal uh, sense of a particular society or culture. That's good, and I think it's important to investigate that, and that's another way of looking at that. It's just a load of coloured lines on the screen. Okay, but it's through time, things are happening, meanings are happening through time, but also at the same time. And actually ritual is polysemic, meanings flow in and out of it. Perhaps we can use uh, some of the uh, approaches of semioticians like Saussure, who signified and signifier, uh, Charles Peirce, the semiotic, Bart and cognitive signified, um, Jacobson, different functions of the sign, uh, Lacan and his upholstery button symbols, the things that really lock in all the way through a particular ritual. But really, I'm erring more towards Derrida with that deference thing now, because what I'm saying is the ritual is taking over. So any particular meaning that we that we might put into the ritual or read from it is is actually secondary to the action of being involved in a ritual. Yeah. So it's being deferred, and there's a reason for deferring it, and that ties in with liminality. <coughs> So let's have a think about um, ritualization of actions, a nomothetical framework. We've already looked at the idea of bundling. I called this, when I was looking at my, in my um, doctoral research, I looked at cremation burials in southeast England. 
And you could look at those in terms of the prevalence of certain objects within them. So you could say, oh, a certain percentage of these burials have beakers in them. A certain percentage have uh, dishes in them, and so on. Right? But actually, I found the most interesting thing about the whole study was that all of them were different in terms of the combination of objects. So there was a language of the type of things you put into burials, but they were all different in terms of the combinations in each burial. And that, after all, is the term of reference. Yeah, People, aren't, people are thinking about maybe the sorts of things that make up a, a funeral in their own uh, cultural historical context, but they do it anew each time. So bundling is interesting in terms of, we'll come back to that, in terms of improvisation. Uh, there's a few references to what I've, been, what I've been looking at it as well. This is why I welcome the Svensson article. I um, was trying to define ritual actions a long time ago, as you can see from this reference. And I, ca I called them, and I'm not saying this is the name for them, but I called them temporal features, things to do with specialising time doing things at a certain time, repeating things, those sorts of things. Um, I also looked at what I called spatial features, in and I was uh, interested to uh, read this article by Parkin in 1992 about this, about how ritual focuses on emphasising spaces and spatial interactions and direction and all those sorts of things. That's, what, that's that area, and it ties in with temporal as well. Since then, I've been um, looking at cremation burials and Roman burials in particular, and I've developed these aspects in terms of preparation of materials and modification of materials, as well as being part of the ritual process. And then installation, not just putting things together and bundling them, but actually burying them or putting them in a place is an action. So here's a shameless bit of advertising. Uh, the book, the Death as a Process book, can be bought down, in the, down on level one, if you wish, uh, from Oxbow Books. And that's the, all to, uh, in there is, my, is a sort of almost up-to-date expression of my dealing with the funerary process and applying it to a particular cemetery. But I've also been involved in looking at this Neolithic site at Chalk Hill, uh, near Ramsgate in Kent, and that's what I'm going to move on to now. So I want to see if the sort of things I'm looking at in terms of funerary ritual apply in terms of the actions of other types of ritual, which are very plainly there in this other site. Drink. How am I doing for time? Sure. Five minutes. Ah. Five minutes. Excellent. Thank you. So there's my uh, way of approaching funerary archaeology. I look at the funerary process, selection of materials, and often the dead body, let's say, is, a, is you could say, well, death selects a person, doesn't it? But actually what we find is that people select a person to be given what we would what we see as an archaeologically visible funeral. So there is a degree of selection involved because there's a lot of people missing from the funerary record. Uh, bits of them scattered around and things like that. They're not visible to us, that's the point. There's a degree of selection, preparation, which is something I really got into looking at inhumation burials in the Roman period, because there's all sorts of amazing information about how people were laid out. Uh, which you can work out from a break, from a thinking about the process of the funeral rather than just looking at the burial. Uh, modification, cremation is probably one of the most serious forms of modification. Deposition and commemoration. And I looked at these evidence types, human remains, materials in direct association with human remains, funerary features and contexts and place deposits. And the last one is the most important thing. You can see how I'm guided by to define this as ritual, I've already got the basic, the baseline that this is human remains, right? And I'm working from that. But looking at it the other way, any burial like that is a combination of objects. It's bundling of objects, including human remains, and it's an installation of 
those things. So I'm sort of I'm trying to take it up from the level of it just being particularly to do with funerals and burials. So an archaeology of ritual action per se could in, employ those things, and I'm rather than commemoration, I've put curation. And, I, and just at the moment, installations and bundling are the primary evidence type that I'm looking at. Now that's my clue that this is a ritual action. Okay, there may well be other ways in which we think about this that can bring forth other evidence types. So quickly, for two minutes, have a look at Chalk Hill Ramsgate, which used to be thought of as a classic causeway enclosure. Causeways are these bits between the, the ditch segments. But actually, when we excavate it, we find that these segments are actually a series of pits that are dug and on, in the same place. The, the causeway is, is an accident, in fact. It's not a part of a ditch that's broken up. Literally. It's focused on the same place. If this material here, these were all these were in the, dip, the earliest pits, and they were the deepest pits, and it was a load of clean, freshly napped flint, and occasionally some retouched pieces in there. Right? So that was, the, that was one of these uh, things. There was also material that had been mixed, possibly curated in a kind of midden, and then deposited in the ends of these things, or in particular pits, and there were other types of things. So I did a kind of typology, which you can see in the book, a typology. One is this really, I think this is fascinating, this caching of freshly napped flints, and then coming back seasonally to dig it up again. These are archaeologists, in fact. They come back and dig up their flints, do whatever they do with them as part of all the other things, which we'll never see because they aren't in the archaeological records, and then they deposit them again, mixed and bundled with other things. And there's a token midden deposit I've got there, and some other typology of deposits. Uh, the point is, I suppose, that I'm not trying to say what these things mean. Thank you. I'm just saying these are, this is the typology of the ritual action. Yeah? The style, if you like. And it changes over time and there are all sorts of different things going on. There's also improvisation going on. So here's another uh, way of outlining it. Selection, flints, pots, cows, <laughs> sheep, goats, shellfish, humans. Preparation, initial flint mapping, caching, breaking. Midden burning, tool manufacturing use, deposition in large pits filled with fresh flint, or midden or small pits or particular place deposits. Curation that incl includes the midden, the caches, human remains which are all disarticulated and curated in some way. And so you can break that down into those types of ritual action: temporal, seasonal fairs, repeated and ordered actions, different types. Spatial focus in the landscape, spatial focus in particular places for the pits and coming back to those things, and also in relation to the pits. Bundling and installation, combinations of materials, particular installation events. And then quickly, I'm going to give you a bit of structure agent dialectic to knock it on the head. All right? And this is why I think improvisation is really interesting. A jazz musician, for example, let's say, let's talk jazz for a minute, right? A jazz musician does not come to, and should not, if they're any good, come to, they might have their chops, as they call it, the things they sort of play if they, if they need to play something quick, but they, they, they have a language of music. They don't have a score, all right? A proper jazz musician, they turn up and they improvise. So they know the sorts of things they're going to do. They know the key it's in, they know the tempo, they know all of those sorts of things. But in doing it, they create a new event every time. And that's what I think rituals do as well. And I think of structure agent dialectic is helpful in this. If you start off with your rules of the ritual, the structure, then you have your agency, which is the actual making of that event based on your own terms of reference, locally, and with other people that you know, and then that in turn generates either new rules or people don't want to pick it up and that just gets lost, so it becomes these <coughs> amazing anomalies, one-offs. You get one-offs in ritual as well. Very obvious in the funerary record you get one-offs. 
But in each, all those cases, what's happening is translation. So the rules are translated into an event. The event is witnessed and uh, participated in and then translated into rules and structure by either taking up or not. And that is the end of my paper. I saw you shift there in the scene. So thank you very much.